Well, good afternoon. My name is uh, Tom Dunn, and I am the Director of Business Solutions at TCIA. Thank you all for joining us in the fifth in a series of webinars TCIA has hosted on important issues for your business related to COVID-19. I'm pleased to introduce our presenter today uh, for today's topic on cultivating resiliency. Amanda Carpenter is the Vice President and Health and Wellness Director at NATS, North American Training Solutions. Amanda has an MS and a doctorate in physical therapy and a BS in health science. Dr. Carpenter is an expert in the science and practice of biomechanics and ergonomics, working with industrial athletes and families to improve their health and vitality. Also serving as a panelist today is Aidan O'Brien, the Advocacy and Standards Manager at TCIA, and Amy Tetrot, who is a Senior Vice President of Corporate Engagement at TCIA. We are gonna keep everybody muted, uh, except for the panelists. You will have the ability to ask questions, which we encourage anytime during the presentation by clicking on the Q&A button and typing them in. And we will try to get to as many as possible in the allotted time. Uh, we are also gonna have a poll uh, with a couple of questions that I would encourage you to participate in. And we will, we will be posting the PowerPoint presentation and the recording of this webinar on tcia.org later today. So with that, I will turn it over to Aiden to get things started. Thanks, Tom. So hi, everyone. My name is Aiden O'Brien, and I'm TCIA's Advocacy and Standards Manager. And a major part of my role is really ensuring TCIA members have all the information and resources um, you need on government policies and laws that come out of Washington, D.C., and also on the state level. And um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, I've seen this role. Um, I see it more important than ever. Um, as the government responds to all the unique economic and public health challenges the virus brings. And already we've seen uh, nearly unprecedented change um, in tax, loan, family leave, and other policies. And that work is only just beginning and we are more sure to come as work begins on a fourth stimulus plan in Washington, DC. So if you have any questions on these topics or just wanna learn a little bit more, TCIA has been putting on a series of webinars um, you can find those on our website at tci.org. Um, there's some great information. And as we begin to see the light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak, um, and states are reopening, we're continuing to ensure that TCIA is a strong advocate for all of our members. So like I said, I highly recommend um, members continue checking on the COVID-19 guidance page on tci.org. Um, lots of great resources there from TCIA and um, other resources across the industry. And we'll continue to update that page regularly. So continue checking back. And so, like Tom said, um, we encourage all of you to ask questions and the Q&A down at the bottom of the screen. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Amanda Carpenter to get us started today. Thank you. Thank you, Aiden. And thank you to TCIA for having me today. I really appreciate that. Um, so as Aiden just mentioned, uh, go ahead and type your questions in the chat box as we go along. I want this to be as interactive as possible. And my main goal is to share with you some information that you can be doing now to improve your own health and resiliency um, as we exit this phase and integrate back out into the world. So if there's any personal questions or concerns, please type those in the, the chat box as we go along and they'll interrupt me. So. North American Training Solutions is a safety training company, and we believe that safety is both an action and a feeling. So it's things that we do, but then it's also the feeling of safety. So for example, the government can require that I do something to be safe, but does that action make me feel safe or not? So we all have our own personal practices that make us feel safe, and we want to honor those. We want to honor the, the safety that the regulatory agencies um, are enacting, but then also what do we each and individually need to do to, to feel safe? Um, and that's to feel safe at all times, to feel safe at home, to feel safe um, at work, and to feel safe in the, the world in the midst of this COVID situation. So um, we define safely as free of risk or harm. So really that, um, that freedom of risk or harm comes from a foundation of meeting our own basic needs. So the need for food, the, ne the need for shelter, um, the need for, for safety, and recognizing that um, we're in a world right now where some people don't feel safe. So based on what's coming from the media, what's coming from those around us, um, you know, we're all getting kind of caught up in this frenzy. And what I challenge each of you to do is to take a step back and think, what do you need to feel 
safe, to feel free of risk or harm to yourself. Not necessarily what the neighbor is doing by buying up all the toilet paper, but what is it that you need to do? So the foundation of all of our safety tra training is built on fostering personal and team resiliency. And resiliency is the capacity to prepare for, recover from, and adapt to stress, challenge, or adversity. So who am I? As Tom did a wonderful introduction, I'm the Vice President and the Health and Wellness Director of North American Training Solutions. Um, Ed Carpenter, the President and CEO, happens to be my brother. So we have a long informal relationship of safety that began back in uh, the 70s when we were growing up. We both grew up in a family logging, family production logging family, family in the Southern Adirondacks. Um, our father was a, was a cutter on a production uh, family run uh, logging crew who had a very, very bad injury, uh, life-threatening injury when both Ed and I were young. And um, in seeing what that did to our family, that's really what set the foundation for both of us to um, live life, making sure that other families didn't withstand this. So as Tom mentioned, I'm a doctor of physical therapy and my foundation is in orthopedics and the biomechanics of how the human body works. So back in 2006, um, Ed and I teamed up and did some biomechanical work looking at uh, how the human body moves when, in a, when climbing in a, in a harness or in a saddle. And since that time, we've had a lot of informal discussions on what safety in the industry looks like. And, um, and looking at, at human performance, foundational human performance, whether it be a sports team or um, the, the tree care industry, you know, what are, we, what are we doing different from a safety standpoint? So we had this conversation uh, a couple years back and I had said to Ed, you know, why are we focusing on what we did wrong? Why are we investigating accidents and safety on what we shouldn't be doing and what we did wrong? And, you know, this is how you should safely be doing things, but, you know, showing gory pictures and looking at what we should do wrong. The professional baseball players, we don't have them visualizing how not to hit the ball. We have them visualizing how to hit the ball. And why is that? And so digging into the science of human performance and the way that visualization works and the way that psychology works and really what runs our brain, Ed and I together teamed up and um, both became certified heart math trainers. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about what that is, but it's basically the heart is what's driving the brain, not the other way around. So um, yes, I do have all these fancy credentials behind my name, but that's not really what makes me who I am. During this pandemic, I've been a wife, I've been a daughter, I've been a sister, I've been an auntie. Um, and really that's made me take a look at what is most important to me. You know, it's not the credentials behind my name, it's not the professional um, credentials that I, that I have, it's really what makes me human. So I would ask all of you to look at yourself as well and think about, you know, what has, what role have you played during this pandemic that you like? And what role have you played that you don't like so much? What are you missing about who you are or who you were? So here's my disclaimer. I cannot teach anybody anything. I can only make them think. So everything that I'm going to share with you is, is based in science and has a science foundation. Um, but as many of you know, statistics, statistics can do a lot of different things. We can, we can make things look differently. Same thing with information. I'm going to share information with you. Some of it might resonate. Some of it might not. Grab on to what does and let go of what doesn't. Uh, the information provided in this session is for educational purposes only and is not medical advice. Nothing in this presentation is meant to be or should be taken as medical advice. As always, consult your medical professional about questions or concerns regarding your own health and before making any health changes. So here's the hero's journey we're going to go on in 60 minutes. Our call to adventure is this current pandemic situation. How do we deal with it personally and how do we deal with it professionally um, as well? Our higher brain centers are shutting down because this fight or flight response uh, that is happening and we're being impacted by what's happening around us. So we've definitely all gone through some challenges and hopefully today we'll discuss how to build your resilience capacity in the midst of chaos. So at the end of this 60 minutes, you can um, then choose how you wanna react and maintain your energy throughout this chaotic situation. So, do our thoughts become reality? You know, time and time again, I have heard from many clients and many patients that, man, I wish I just had more time. I wish I had more time with family. I wish I had more time to work on myself and do my self care. I wish I had more time to spend with my real friends. You know, I wish I had more time um, to, you know, 
see those that I love. I wish I had more time to sleep. You know, we've got all this extra time. And so I would challenge you to think of, of how the last six weeks or eight weeks have been for you. And what things did you say before that you didn't have time for that you now have time and you didn't honor? You know, maybe there's, there's some sort of block about those things because we're faced with the time and the, the time we may or may not want to spend it doing different things that we need to. I think this has been some of the the best self-discovery time that we could pass, possibly ask for, but self-discovery is not always an easy thing. So we were living in a stressful world prior to this pandemic, and the pandemic has just added to, to the stress. So stress has been declared a global epidemic of the 21st century by the World Health Organization. It's been estimated that 75 to 90 percent of doctors' visits are actually due to stress. Work-related stress is a huge problem and will remain a huge problem. The United Nations stated that work-related stress is one of the greatest issues facing the world today. That was back in 2012, and we really don't have a better handle on that in 2020. According to a 2015 Stress in America survey, 65% of people reported work as their source of stress. According to the American Institute of Stress, 80% of employees feel stress on the job and nearly half say they need help learning how to manage. So therein lies an opportunity. This is an opportunity for the tree care industry. We're already compromised on um, having a workforce. We're, uh, we already don't have enough uh, of a workforce in the green industry. So if nearly half of employees say that they need help learning how to manage stress, if we help them learn to manage stress, that's going to help to improve, improve employee retention, it's gonna increase productivity, and it's gonna reduce accidents. So stress is a contributing factor in all causes of death. The top 10 reasons for death in the US and the top 10 reasons of death in Canada, accidents are in the top 10 in both, number four in the US and number five in Canada. And so those accidents could be a motor vehicle accident, could be a chipper related accident, anything declared an accident, but stress is a contributing factor. So what is stress? Stress is a perceived loss of control. It's the unknown. So what stress can do is it can trigger a stress response, but stress is not the same in everybody. We use stress as a general term, but stressor is what makes me, if I engage um, in a situation where I experience a stressor, that's going to stimulate a stress response in myself. So somebody might engage in that exact same situation and not feel stress from that. So it's a physiological aspect of what happens in the body when I experience a stressor. So to me, a perceived loss of control, the unknown, to me, that isn't necessarily a scary thing anymore because I've experienced so many things in my life and I've learned that releasing control is actually a more fun way to live and an easier way to live. But to some people, that, that loss of control will do anything, and I say we because it used to be me, to hold on to that. So this pandemic and this perceived loss of control has really triggered this mass hysteria and this mass fight or flight response. So we have an opportunity though, when we change the way we look at things, the things we look at change. So hopefully that's what I'm going to share with you today. Are we going to see this pandemic as an unknown scary thing, or are we going to look at it as an opportunity and what we can do? So perceived negative stress or that stressor drains our batteries. So drains our energy down, which can increase our negative, negative emotional response to situations and inhibit our ability to think clearly. So that's the key. It can inhibit our ability to think clearly, called cortical inhibition. So if a situation happens to me where I perceive that a negative stress, so somebody is up in my face, you know, yelling at me, sends my heart rate elevated, and I have a fight or flight response going on in my, in my body, that not only drains my battery, but it also inhibits my ability to think clearly in the moment. What do we always say when an accident occurs? What the hell were they thinking? What we now know is they weren't thinking. We stop thinking in the midst of a fight or flight response and we become reactive, we become reflexive during that. So that's what's real important to understand here. 
So the HeartMath Institute um, back in the mid 90s identified that there's actually more nerve endings running from the heart up to the brain than vice versa. And since that time, 400 peer reviewed articles, uh, journal articles have proven that, that it's actually the electrical signal coming from the heart that sends a signal to the brain that then either perceives the stress or stays grounded. So for example, we've all, I'm sure, watched National Geographic where you see the gazelles in the field, you know, eating, and then one lifts up and they reflexively all lift their heads up at the same time. We used to think that was mere neurons in the brain and we used to think that was just a brain-based response. Well, now we know the electrical field of the heart changes and the gazelle look up and say, what, 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 what? And they're looking for the stress. So what happens is if I pick up on a stress in my environment, it can send my heart into what's called an incoherent rhythm, an incoherent pattern. And then I start looking for the perceived stress. And we have a lot of, of stressors in our environment that are causing us to do this. So we're constantly in this stress response and it really comes down to the electrical, the electromagnetic field of the heart. Now coherence actually facilitates brain function. And a lot of people have heard this as being grounded. If we stay grounded and we don't um, end up kicking into that fight or flight stress response, that actually facilitates brain function. So these heart rhythms directly affect brain centers that are involved in our foresight, our decision-making, our social awareness, and most importantly, our ability to self-regulate. So stress and emotions ultimately deplete our battery. So they not only drain the battery, making me feel exhausted and taking energy out of my system to boost my immune system, for example, but they also cause my brain centers, the higher brain centers to shut down a bit. So stress can cause anxiety and frustration, the inability to concentrate, feelings of overwhelm, fatigue, depression, irritability, anger, the inability to, react, to relax, overreaction to situations, procrastination, neglecting responsibilities, violence, poor judgment, constant worry, loss of object, objectivity, uh, body tension, and headaches. And this is all well supported by the research. But again, what's most important to understand is that stress inhibits brain function. So if I am functioning in a fight or flight stress response, my higher brain centers are shut down. If I know how to run a chipper safely, if I know how to engage in safe chainsaw use, but I am stuck in a stress response, I'm not going to be able to access the higher brain functions in order to do that. So viruses are contagious, but so is panic, fear, hysteria, calm, love, enthusiasm, kindness, joy. Choose wisely. And this comes from Dr. Daniel Amen. He's a psychiatrist and a brain health expert. And this actually comes directly in understanding that the heart is in control of the brain. So we can actually pick up on fields around us. So our coherent field can actually settle somebody down, can ground somebody or vice versa. So the fields of people around us can affect us. So initially there was this mass hysteria that was happening and people were buying up all the toilet paper and you know, going to the stores and acting irrationally. And then you stop and think, well, if we don't have food to eat, what are we gonna need the toilet paper for? Like, it seems so irrational, but this is exactly what happens when we go into this mass hysteria. Now, the opposite is also true. So the calm, the love, the excitement, the kindness, that is also very contagious. So we have the ability to choose. So these heart rhythms affect others, and this is proven through science. The heart has an electromagnetic field that extends out at least five feet. The brain, only about a foot maximum. So that's how we know that the heart fields, these electrical fields are impacting others. Now the magnetometers to measure this only extend out five feet, but we have lots of anecdotal evidence to prove that this actually can happen across countries. You know, have you ever had the situation where you're thinking about somebody and then boom, they text you or they call you, um, you know, or, or something comes up and you're like, oh my gosh, at that exact time that happened, they have done studies where they hook people up to, um, to monitors to look at their heart rate variability in these rhythms where somebody is sick in a bed and people are praying for them and literally we see their heart rhythm change. So this has been proven that this heart field extends out. So the field that we're putting out there can be a field of fear where other people go right into that field or the field we're putting out there can be a caring, loving, supporting, um, compassionate field, but others can be affected by our field. 
Everything can be taken from a man, but one thing, the last of the human freedoms to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. And that's a quote by Viktor Frankl. When it comes to this mass hysteria that is going on in this pandemic and what the media is sharing with us, I want you to keep in mind that's one perspective. We have the ability to choose what we take on. Do we take that on as our own truth or do we look elsewhere? Do we turn the television off and check in just once a day so that we're not caught up in this mass hysteria and all the negativity? The reporting of numbers means nothing if, if we don't understand the definition behind that. So just keep in mind, you have the ability to choose your own decision. So resilience is the capacity to prepare for, recover from, and adapt in the face of stress, challenge, or adversity. And this is a definition of resilience that comes out of the HeartMath Institute. Prior to becoming certified in HeartMath and how these heart rhythms affect action of the brain and um, affect others, I thought of resiliency as the ability to bounce back. You know, so if somebody bounces back from an illness, they're resilient. If they back, bounce back from an injury, they're resilient. But what the HeartMath Institute taught me is, um, and this was posed from the military, you can't bounce back from death. So we want a definition of resilience, being able to build our capacity in the midst. So the other important part of resilience, it's our capacity. So often we say we don't have time to do something, I don't have time. Well, time is finite, we can't expand time, but we actually can expand our capacity. We have the ability to make time feel like it's slowing down. When we have a good charge battery and we stay very grounded, we're not wasting the energy. So what I want, to, want you to think about resilience, it's like a battery. And there are things that charge our battery and there are things that drain our battery. When our battery is charged, we're functioning optimally. When our battery is drained, we're functioning not so optimally. So certain emotions can impact the charge on this battery. It's not that we're not going to have these negative or what we call these depleting emotions. It's the decision to honor the fact that we're feeling sad on one day. And what can we do to charge that battery? And these can be engaging in self-care practices, um, you know, Epsom salt baths, taking a walk. What are the things that we can do to charge our batteries? This is a quote from 2002. It's been one of my favorites and it definitely stands true in everything that I have ever done from um, what has happened with my father's own injury to what I experienced in the physical therapy office. More than education, more than experience, more than training, a person's level of resilience will determine who succeeds and who fails. That's true in the cancer ward, it's true in the Olympics, and it's true in the boardroom. And that was by Diane Coutu in Harvard Business Review back in 2002. So I really think when we look at this resilience and the ability to build our capacity, those that have resilience will survive and thrive. So this pandemic and the social distancing has allowed us the opportunity to turn within. What do I need to build my resilience capacity? Everything I said I didn't have time to do before, now I'm giving the time to do this. So I think that if we choose, we can actually come out of this stronger than what we went into it as. So how do we build resilience? Building resilience, there's been several uh, research studies to identify how we build resilience. Um, and I'm gonna list these over and then I'm gonna go into some details. So maintaining good relationships with close family members, friends, and others, that has been proven to improve resilience. Avoid seeing crises or stressful events as unbearable problems. Accept circumstances that cannot be changed develop realistic goals and move towards them, take decisive actions in adverse situations, look for opportunities for self-discovery, develop self-confidence, keep a long-term perspective and consider the stressful event in a broader context, maintain a hopeful outlook, expecting good things and visualizing what is wanted. Take care of the mind and body, exercising regularly and paying attention to needs and feelings. And heart math techniques have also been proven to build resilience. So these are all things that research has shown to build and improve resilience. And these go as far back as 10 years ago. I think there's so much opportunity in the current pandemic to build our resilience capacity in the midst. So heart math techniques, these are scientifically validated techniques to build resilience. So I'm gonna teach all of you the most simplistic foundational heart math technique, it's called heart-focused breathing. So it can be done in, it's not meant to be a meditative technique, it can be done with your eyes open, it can be done while you're driving, it can be done while you're sitting at your desk. But it goes like this, focus your attention in the area of your heart, 
Imagine your breath is flowing in and out of your heart or chest area, breathing a little slower and a little deeper than usual. Inhale five seconds, exhale five seconds, or whatever rhythm is comfortable. So by focusing our attention in the area of the heart, what that does is it causes us to breathe deeper within ourselves. When we're in stress response, we're breathing through the shoulders. When we focus our attention in the area of the heart, we're filling the lungs. We're telling the body that I'm okay. When I'm breathing through my shoulders, based on the rhythm that um, is being sent, it's telling my body that I'm in stress response. So we do this with law enforcement officers. We do this with military. In fact, the military utilizes heart math techniques. They just don't call them heart math techniques. They call them resilience building techniques. We call it tactical breathing. So it's basically focusing your breathing through your chest area. Imagine your breath is flowing in and out of your chest area. What that does is it sends a signal to the brain that says, I am safe, I am okay. So do we have any questions, Aiden, before I go on? Is there any questions about that technique? I haven't seen any yet. Okay. All right, so be the change you wish to see in the world. This breathing technique is something that you can do to keep yourself grounded. What that will do is that will put a very positive beneficial field five feet out away from you that can actually help to decrease the fear and dissipate the fear in others that are around you. So if you're working on a, on a crew, um, doing this tactical breathing in the midst will start to focus you, allow you to come out of a stress response, but then it's also going to affect those around you as well. So be the change you wish to see in the world. Don't get caught up in, this, in the negativity and the fear because that's what you're going to see more of. Start to stay grounded, breathe through your chest area, and it's amazing what that can actually do. So I would challenge you all to just play around with that technique a little bit. So another thing that we can do that research shows to improve our resilience capacity is to accept circumstances that cannot be changed. This is where a lot of us become angry. When we start to fight, we can't change these circumstances. We can become angry about it. But it was Buddha, I believe, that said, anger is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. <laughs> so if I'm mad at the government because they're requiring me to stay home, you know, being mad is only draining my own battery and hurting me. So what can I do about that? If I'm feeling stressed about having to stay at home, I can choose to embrace it. Remember, we have the choice. So it's a great time to reset, take a walk, explore your yard, sit in the sunshine. If the sunshine ever comes out, it hasn't been out here in upstate New York in a really long time. Take a nap, take an Epsom salt bath. Epsom salts actually give us magnesium sulfate. Magnesium is a great muscle relaxant and sulfate helps us to detoxify. Clean out a closet or a drunk uh, or a uh, junk drawer. There's, I've been wanting to clean out my closet for like 12 years. <laughs> and I'm always like, I don't have the time. I don't have the time. I don't have the time. Well, now we have the time to clean out. It's a great way to clear out the, the things in our life that no longer serve us. Be resourceful and creative with what you can create from your freezer or your pantry. So cleaning out, digging back into that pantry, pantry and finding, you know, what is back in there that's about to expire that you could be resourceful and make some really interesting uh, dinner out of. Read a book. Uh, watch an inspirational documentary. And the reason that I say inspirational is be cautious with putting more fear in your head. There are some documentaries out there that just can leave you feeling more afraid after you watch them. So watch an inspirational one. FMTV is a subscription base. They've got some great foundational health documentaries. And then even consider this a retreat. It's a forced stay at home retreat. Limit your news and your social media check-in to just once a day or, you know, even once a week if you're brave about that. So you can embrace it. Between stimulus and response, there's a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. That's another Viktor Frankl quote. So Viktor Frankl, for those of you who don't know, was a Holocaust survivor. He was in a concentration camp. And um, when everything else was taken from him, his ability to choose his reaction to the situation was the one thing he could hang on to. And he taught us all a lot. You know, We can choose to see this as an opportunity or we can choose to see it as um, you know, a, a forced negative thing. So embrace this as an opportunity to work on yourself, your family, and your home, even home projects. There's lots of home projects that, you know, I wish I had the time or when I had the time. 
you know, now we do have the time and our priorities have switched a little bit. One of the most important things I think you can do to um, improve your resilience is to work on your circadian balance. This is the, the biggest complaint that I'm seeing from those um, clients and patients that I consult with is they're not sleeping well. And one of the reasons we're not sleeping well is our whole, our whole routine and our whole rhythm of life has changed. If I don't have to be somewhere tomorrow morning, what's to prevent me from staying up late at night? So there is something beautiful in maintaining routines or the rhythm of life. So try to sleep during darkness hours. That really does a lot to tell your body what it's supposed to be doing when. There's a whole biochemistry that happens in our body um, that is based on circadian balance. And all of our organs have a certain circadian rhythm of when we should be eating, when we're detoxifying, that sort of thing. So I would challenge you to sleep during darkness hours. Get up, get natural light upon awaking in the morning. So open up your blinds, you know, wake up and then make it as bright as possible without turning on artificial lights, but just the natural light. Even if it's a gloomy overcast day, what that does is there's a spectrum that comes off of the sunshine that sends a hormonal cascade through our body to tell us what we should be doing. What's happening because of the chronic stress that's happening in the world is so many people's circadian balance is off because we have a lot of release of cortisol. Cortisol is released during the stress response. It has a half-life of 12 hours, so it keeps us up at night. So we can do a lot to reset that balance just through natural sunshine. Those who are working out in the, the world, doing any sort of production work, and you're, and you're getting natural light, um, I bet you're actually having an easier time sleeping than those of us who are stuck behind screens all day. When we are sleeping, we want complete darkness. Any light that comes in whatsoever um, disrupts that circadian balance. So the test that you do for this is you close your eyes when you're in bed, you then put your hands over your eyes, and if it gets darker, then it's not dark enough in the room you're sleeping in. Either turn off the lights, um, if you can't turn off the lights or pull the, the blinds more, then a uh, sleep mask is really beneficial. Another important thing to balance your circadian rhythm is to remove wireless electronics from the bedside. So those wireless electronics can actually send waves that disrupt the heart and disrupt the brain rhythms that can give us an input, a stimulus input that tells us things are happening. So a lot of us will use cell phones by our bedside as an alarm clock. I would challenge you uh, to put it across the room. When you have it in airplane mode, if you have a Wi-Fi signal, the Wi-Fi is still coming into that. So airplane mode isn't enough to protect you from that signal. And those, those Wi-Fi signals um, come through electromagnetic fields, just like our heart has an electromagnetic magnetic field, and that can affect our brain and our, and our heart rhythm. Get outside in natural light daily, ideally three times. So as close to waking up in the morning as possible, those of us that have dogs, um, go outside with the dog in the morning and get your first, you know, blast of, of natural sunlight. Get outside somewhere around noontime <clears throat> or your lunchtime, <clears throat> excuse me, and then sometime around sunset or the afternoon. Limit your blue light exposure. One of the main reasons I believe a lot of people are having trouble sleeping is we're spending even more time on screens than we normally do. And the blue light that comes off of screens disrupts our circadian balance. So one of the things you can do is wear blue light blocking glasses. Um, I do have them on my head and I do wear them all the time. I don't wear them when I'm presented because it, it interferes with you being able to see my eyes. Um, but blue light blocking glasses can be very beneficial. There's also blue light blocking software or night mode that you can um, turn on in your devices, either in the computer settings or in your phone settings. And then ultimately just limit your screen time. One of the things that I'm hopeful for after this pandemic is we close our laptops, we turn off our phones at five o'clock and we're done with technology. You know, before we were trying to manage technology all the time and the feedback that I'm getting from a lot of people is that they've just had it with technology. So I think that may be one of the blessings that's gonna come out of all of this. And then the last thing to do to improve your circadian balance is eat during daylight hours. So as I mentioned earlier, the digestive tract is set on a circadian rhythm. So not eating after dark, after dark is a real, really important thing to maintaining that. So sunshine has so many benefits um, and I'm hopeful that the sun will come out in the Northeast sometime soon. In the past six weeks, I think we've only seen it for two or three days. <laughs> But um, the research is real strong. UV radiation from the sun is a primary germicide in our environment. 
Um, and this is known, these, these are the two research studies that these came from. Sunlight specifically, solar UV radiation acts as a principal and natural viricide, meaning it kills viruses. So we actually need sunshine ourselves, our clothes, our bedding, um, you know, we can disinfect a lot of things. Um, Aiden, was there a question? Yeah, we just had a question about the um, blue light glasses. Do you have a good resource for um, buying those or any suggestions about um, where one could get those? Uh, so great question. There's lots of different ones you can get um, from a $10 pair to, you know, $150 pair. It just depends on how much light they're going the spectrum that they're going to block. The one thing that I will say are the yellow lenses are meant to be worn during the day. They block only harmful blue light from LED lights and from the screens. They don't block the good beneficial coming off of the sunshine. Orange ones are meant to be worn at night. They block all blue light. So my recommendation would be don't invest in a $150 pair if you're not sure you're gonna use them because to some people the color changes can bother them. Invest in a $10 pair. Make sure that you're gonna use them, see how it feels um, before you, you spend more money on that. But something is better than nothing. Yeah, it's a yellow tint. Great question. That's it, good. All right. So laughter is a great immune booster. Fear and anger suppress the immune system while laughter can boost it. So when we actually look at the biochemistry in the body um, based on emotions, we, we have emotions divided into two different categories. Uh, there's depleting emotions that deplete our system and have a negative impact on our biochemistry. And then there's um, renewing emotions that charge our battery and actually have a positive. And all of this is proven through science and blood work of what can happen. So um, this is a great time to really work on, you know, laughing, just laugh more. I spent a lot of time the past six weeks with my eight year old niece and just giggled and laughed. It's unbelievable how much kids laugh. Uh, I played Pictionary online uh, at a happy hour, virtual happy hour with my friends that created a ton of laughter. Um, so look for these opportunities to boost your immune system with laughter. One of, our, um, one of the, the core aspects of our mission at NATS is sustainability and sustainability of the environment, but also sustainability of ourselves, which really to me is resiliency. So there's a lot we can look to to work on the sustainability during this time, um, just through simple conservation, being mindful of single use products. Um, such as toilet paper, paper towels, paper plates, plastic, um, straws, things like that. Just starting to be mindful of that. Um, this is a great time to clean out the pantry or the freezer to avoid future waste of expired goods. You know, we want to, we don't want to have to throw anything away. We can cleanse and declutter using what we have. You know, so often we have stuff that sits in the pantry or sits in the closet that never gets used and we just it's easier to just go buy new you know we're such a disposable society so I think this pandemic is a great time to really look at what do we have in our homes and how can we not only declutter but how can we be more sustainable and protect the environment by using less hanging our clothes outside to dry as I just mentioned sunshine is a great way uh, to disinfect things there's also um, natural microbes from outside that'll get onto your, your uh, clothes and onto your uh, linens that you then bring inside and it's actually good uh, for your, your own microbiome and the microbiome of your house. And then tending to your own soil, which is your, your body's terrain. There are so many bugs out in the world, we'll never win the war on bugs. You know, there's limited access to what uh, healthcare and medicine can treat us with the microbes are far smarter than we are but what we can do is we can tend to our own soil and really as i mentioned before sus sustainability to me on the human aspect what makes us sustainable is resiliency what does our resiliency look like the first immune defense begins on our skin our outer layer of our skin and then the inner mucous membranes the surfaces so normal microbiome flora are part of this defense. And one of the concerns that I have is that when we try to sterilize kind of air quotes, when we clean our environment and we kill the microbes, we can't kill the bad without killing the good. And there was a lesson to be learned from the use of antibacterial soap um, back in the, the late 90s and early 2000 was, ooh, we killed some of the beneficial microbes. 
I think we're going to see the same thing happening um, with everything that we're doing right now. If we're constantly washing our hands and washing ourselves with harsh chemicals, we're changing that microbiome. So just being aware of what you're washing your hands with. Now it's actually soap, it's the slipperiness of soap that breaks down the fat layer of the virus to kill the virus and it's how long we wash for. So it's not the harsh chemical that kills, it's actually um, what makes soap slippery. So even like a homemade goat's soap, goat's milk soap can be just as beneficial against this virus as you know, some sort of chemical. Now, soap is better than the, um, than the alcohol because of that, because soap and washing with the soap will break down that fat layer of the virus, whereas the alcohol in hopes is just going to kill the virus. So we want to be very aware of when we're washing our hands. Yes, we want to wash our hands when we're, when we're around people and when we're around surfaces that might have bad microbes on it. However, if you're a production arborist and you're out in the field and you've been climbing a tree and there's no herbicides and there's no pesticides on that tree that you know of, you've had no human you know, interaction, I would challenge you to go ahead and eat that sandwich without washing your hands and put some of those soil-based microbes back in. So really what makes up soil, when we think about the soil that allows these trees and allows the greenery to grow in, when we sterilize soil, nothing's going to grow. The same thing is, is true to the humans. There is this microbiome flora that we need to tend to. So just as you would test soil and just as you would think about what is in that soil, think about what's in your own soil, in your own body, because we have this microbiome on our skin, in our mucous membranes, in our gut that actually protect us. And we may be disrupting that by being too sterile. Now we have to kill the bad, we have to be aware of that, but look for the opportunities where you can put the good back in. So there is a molecule that's actually excreted from healthy flora um, that has been shown to tighten the tight junctions in our gut. And what that does is it protects our gut's lining, the microbiome, from things leaking out of that. Now, the research has shown that the, the, the flora that actually produce that are now depleted in our soil. And there's lots of different theories as to why that's depleted. So um, there are some things on the market I gave you guys in the references. There's something called Ion Gut Health that actually gives you that, that molecule. You can look into that if you're interested in that, understanding the soil and understanding what that's all about. But um, to me, I believe that's one of the best foundational ways to work on the microbiome because our, our microbiomes are individual and different. Everybody's microbiome is different. So if I'm taking a probiotic, it's going to be different than the probiotic that Aiden takes because his microbiome is different. So how do we know what's foundational? I think what's foundational is restoring the balance in our own soil, um, in, in our own health, and not necessarily putting microbes in. Alrighty, so how can we improve our soil health to build our immunity? Um, mitigating our stress. The effects of stress suppress our immune system. They actually open those tight junctions that I was just speaking of. Um, we can also do resilience building practices to reduce the effects of stress. Now I challenge us, we're not gonna reduce the stress in our, and the stressors in our environment, but we can reduce our, the effects of stress on our body by having control over our reaction to that. And when really when we talk about building our resilience, it's really becoming more grounded and not reacting negatively to the stressors around us. Research shows that hanging out with your pets is actually really good for your microbiome. So exposure to pets has been associated with positive immune development, um, reduced asthma, better microbiomes. One of the theories is the dogs and the pets actually bring the outdoors in, bring those soil-based microbes in. Engaging in your social network. Strong social connections have been shown to be associated um, with fewer colds. So this is one that, you know, how do we engage in these so socially when we're having to do the social distancing? There's lots of ways you can do that with a phone call, with a FaceTime, doing a Zoom meeting with friends. Um, there's lots of ways to do this. Um, the one thing I just want to throw out there is herd immunity. And I have a question mark on that because it's just something I want you to think about. You know, when we open... Um, and we reintegrate back into society again, we have all been at home socially isolated from all sorts of different microbes. And there is something to be said about the potential of herd immunity that, you know, healthy people become sick and then develop antibodies against things. So engaging in, in social um, and having interaction with friends, does that help to build our herd immunity? 
people who socially isolate prior to this pandemic have been shown to not have good, strong immune systems. So is it because people were developing that herd immunity by engaging in their social networks? Just something I'm tossing out there. Um, how else can we build our immunity? According to research, keep a positive and optimistic attitude. When we go into that fight or flight response, when we go into that stress response, it actually stops digestion. It interrupts the whole microbiome and what's happening with digestion. Um, laughing. Laughter was found to increase natural killer T cell activity for up to 12 hours after laughter. So laughing is a great way to boost our immune system to, to build that resilience capacity. Engaging in physical activity. The frequency of aerobic activity has been correlated with less days of illness, meaning a shorter time of sickness. So if somebody gets sick and they're sick for two weeks versus that person who regularly engages in physical activity might only be sick for three days. So what physical activity does is it allows us to move um, our lymphatic system, which is tied into the immune system and carries the sewage throughout our body. So physical activity is super important. And physical activity is really movement. It's hiking, it's getting outside and walking. It's not necessarily mindless exercise on a treadmill. That's exercise. Physical activity meaning movement is what we're talking about. Good hey, Amanda? Yeah. Can I jump in here? Just because I, I just wanted to share a little bit of an anecdote. Um, yeah. And just something that I've learned that's kind of apropos to this part of it. Absolutely. Um, particularly with the physical activity aspect of it is that I, uh, I tend to overcommit and I do a lot. I feel as though a lot of people um, kind of in this space are probably really similar to me in that. I think that this whole situation has really given me a time um, for self-discovery. And again, this is Amy with TCIA. Um, so I think one of the things that I've found that has been really successful for me is letting go and foregoing the idea of expectation, particularly when it re um, relates to physical activity. Um, I'm a runner. I like to keep myself really, really active during quote unquote normal times. Um, and I've found that forcing myself to do those has had an adverse effect. Um, it stresses me out a little bit more. So I, I've, I've been trying to ride the wave that I am. I'm on, I guess. So runs haven't felt really good when I started this. I was like, I'm going to run 20 miles every day. This is going to be epic. And that does not feel good for me. It stresses me out. So instead, adjusting to just taking really, really long walks. Um, you know, I really like to work out and I find that really like intense workouts don't feel good. They don't, they don't help me on my day to day. So instead of really, really leaning on my yoga practice. So I think it took me a couple weeks, but setting aside that idea of expectation um, and just being really honest with myself and not forcing myself has really allowed me to find myself a little bit more and be more resilient. And then therefore that has also translated that I find that I'm much more successful in, you know, my work and what I want to get done when I'm not trying to fit myself into um, a box of maybe where I was before or where I think I should be. So I just wanted to kind of put that out there because that was a big part of um, where I was at for the first few weeks in this idea of um, resiliency and during this pandemic. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. That's, that's a great point. I just heard you say where I think I should be. And that's exactly what we all have to look at. You know, whose story is that? Did society tell me that's where I should be? Am I holding myself accountable to that? And that's what I've really found, even in my background as a physical therapist in, in orthopedics, that we have this self-expectation of what ideal exercise looks like. But exercise, by definition, causes oxidative stress in the body. It's a breakdown of a system to make it stronger. So during this time, we don't want to be breaking down. We want to be building. And that's the difference between exercise and physical activity. So I love that you listened to your body's intuition saying we want to be building. We don't want to be breaking down because there's this period of breakdown with, with exercise where we're more susceptible for about 24 hours after exercise, we're actually more susceptible to catching things. And that's a lesson that I learned when I was ill with chronic Lyme disease is I was like, I'm going to exercise my way out of this. This is going to be awesome. You know, and I'd go for a one mile jog and be like totally beat. And that's when I, even though professionally I knew the biochemistry behind everything, the story I was telling myself was I need to exercise. And so I had to change that story that I was telling myself. So really when we look at how the human body moves, we're designed to engage in primal movements, meaning, you know, running, jumping, climbing. What would our ancestors have had to do for survival? I'm sure there wasn't any cavemen that were going out there running marathons just to run. You know, they were engaging in physical activity for survival. 
And that's really what our body's meant to do. They might have had to, you know, chase down an animal and they would have been sprinting for short distances, you know, doing that interval training. And I think that's why interval training is very well supported by the research and having beneficial effects on the body. So that's a wonderful example. Thank you for sharing. And I'm so glad that you listened to your body's intuitive wisdom of that didn't feel good rather than overriding that with the story you were telling yourself and know I should be able to do that. And I think that's a, a wonderful lesson for everybody is to listen to your body. The, the intuitive wisdom of the body is unbelievable. I truly believe that the, the doctor of the future is the patient. And one of my roles is to get people to listen to that intuitive wisdom and to honor that. So thank you for sharing that, Amy. That was great. Um, okay, a few more things to build our immunity. Get good sleep. Sleep deprivation increases inflammation and it produces immunodeficiency. So I think we could do an entire webinar just on what we can do to enhance our sleep um, to make sure that we're decreasing inflammation and build our immune system even more. So there's a lot to that. Eating whole foods, have a diverse diet, try your best where you can to eat whole foods, what the body is designed to run on and not so much processed foods. Yes, clean out that pantry and have fun with that, but try your best to get access to whole foods where you're able to. And a di diverse diet is really important. And then support your gut, your GI tract. 70% of our immune system is in the gut, which is why I'm so caught up on this microbiome and the soil inside of our body, because 70% of the immune system is actually in the gut. When we strengthen those tight junctions, it actually prevents un unwanted molecules, including microbes, from entering our system. Ooh, a quick poll just popped up. Everybody take a moment to answer the poll questions. Yep, I just threw that up, Amanda. Awesome, perfect. We'll just take a moment. Hey Amanda, while we're waiting, uh, yeah. I was interested the uh, the building resiliency list you had back in a couple slides ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You had one up there for developing self confidence, mm -hmm. and it was a little bit off what you've been talking about. But I don't know if you had any um, examples or, or strategies for that. Um, sure, that's you know a lot of that comes down to the story that we're telling ourselves. Are we handing off? Um, the decision to decide what's best for me to somebody else, or am I confident that um, my intuitive wisdom knows best? So it's really learning to trust yourself and to know that you have all that you need and your intuition, your gut feelings about what should be done and what feels good is most important. And that applies to all aspects of life. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Aiden, do we have any questions? Because there was just one last slide and then I'm all done. I don't see any right now, but I actually have one. Yeah. Um, do you have any like strategies to sort of get um, other teammates to take these home, take what you've gone over home with them? Because I think we have um, some people listening, but how can we get like um, entire companies or entire teams to sort of build on these good habits? Yeah, so the key is be the change that you want to see. Nobody wants to be told what to do, but if they see you having good energy and feeling good, they're going to be like, Hey, what, what are you doing? They're going to start to ask questions. So I've learned that with anything health related, you know, I share with people a lot of information of what they could do with their health and not because I'm trying to overwhelm them, but I expect them only to grab onto a few things. What resonates with them? What is their intuitive wisdom telling them they need to work on? So people will start to ask questions when they see you acting differently. And I think that's the best thing that we can do is start to work on yourself. And through that heart field, you will change and people will start to enter and say, hey, you know, what are you doing? And, and ask questions rather than just saying, hey, this expert said you should be doing this. That'll fail every time. <laughs> so great question. Any other questions that are coming through? No, how are we doing on the poll? Uh, yeah, it looks like everybody has at least looked at it and most people have voted on it. So thank you for that. Perfect, awesome. So if there's, is there, there's no other questions, Aiden? 
No, I don't see any right now. Okay, so maybe what we can do is go back to that. So I shared with you what the research has actually shown um, to build resilience, and we can just kind of go over those just a little bit. Um, because I did just mention those, they, I didn't necessarily, I pulled a few of them to go over, um, but not all of them. So maintaining good relationships with close family, fr family members, friends, and others. Um, I think for some people, maintaining those close relationships with family has been challenging because we've been stuck at home with family. Um, and it's allowed us to really go deeper into those relationships. But don't forget to maintain good relationships with those that we're not living with. So reaching out through Zoom, uh, Zoom actually has a free platform where you can get together with, with your friends for 20 minutes. They allow for 20 minutes um, and it's free. So use those opportunities for social engagement the best you possibly can. Um, avoid seeing crisis or stressful events as unbearable problems. Again, I think we touched on that with looking at how do you choose to see this pandemic? You know, is the government regulating you or is there an opportunity? And you, know, you, have a, you have a choice in how you react. You might not have a choice in the regulations, but you have a choice in how you react to them. Um, develop realistic goals and move towards them. You know, all of those things that we didn't think we had time for, um, we now have the time for. So what are the goals that are most important? What things did you tell yourself before this pandemic that you wanted to do that you still haven't got to? You know, maybe it's not a realistic goal. Maybe it's not something you truly want. So really setting good personal and professional goals for yourself during this time, you know, now that you've had time. Um, take decisive actions in adverse situations. You know, knowing that you have all that you need when you stay grounded and when you do that heart-focused breathing or that tactical breathing, it will allow you to access everything that's in the brain. You know, everything we've ever been exposed to and downloaded. There's so much that is housed in our brain that we can access when we actually stay grounded. So in those moments of adverse situations, we can actually, if we stay grounded, we can have this expansive network of opportunity of ways to react. Um, look for opportunities for self-discovery. I think we had talked about that. Develop self-confidence. Um, and as I mentioned to you, Tom, that's really in knowing that we have all of the, the right tools and just asking yourself those simple questions. If there's a regulation that's coming down from government, just ask yourself, you know, how do I want to react to that? Um, one of the things that I'll throw out there is when it comes to face masks, you know, there's, there's a regulation in wearing face masks. But, you know, what does the face mask block? You know, am I going to be able to exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide through that mask? Is it going to protect me from the viruses that I want to? What about, you know, toxins from my environment? So asking those questions that seem like so simplistic, but, you know, nobody else is necessarily asking those, that will help you to develop the self-confidence and knowing you have all that you need. Um, looking at the long-term perspective and consider this, stressful event in broader context. What do you want your world to look like? What is your life rhythm gonna look like after this pandemic? We've had an opportunity, a forced opportunity to, to try life out differently of not leaving the house. All those mornings that we woke up and like, oh, I don't wanna leave, I don't wanna go to work. Well, we've now had that opportunity. You know, what do you like and what do you not like? You now have the ability to choose moving forward. We like to call it, um, in NATS, we like to call it work-life rhythm rather than work-life balance. It's the rhythm. You know, right now we're in a different work-life rhythm than we were before. Um, and now you have this opportunity to, to change. And then maintain a hopeful outlook, expecting good things and visualizing what is wanted. You know, what do you want your world to look like? Don't get caught up in what the media is telling you the world is going to look like after this, but what do you? You have a lot of choices within your home environment and within your work environment. And what do you want that to look like? So is there any other questions? So outside of uh, this presentation and recording, which will both be posted on TCI.org, um, what are some other resources we, um, you could send your team to or we could send our teams to to learn more about all of this? To learn more about resiliency? Exactly. Yeah, yeah so there's a great, HeartMath has a, um, it's called the HeartMath Experience. It's a 90-minute um, little kind of documentary that shares what heart math is all about and how you can personally work on your own resiliency through breathing techniques and also through changing perspective. It's called the heart math experience. They're offering it for free right now. So that's a wonderful resource. Um, I would also recommend when it comes to the environment and cleaning and, and being aware of your microbiome, I would check out environmentalworkinggroup.org. 
for, you know, from a chemical standpoint, what can interfere with your own microbiome, um, that would be another great resource to check out as well. Um, we got another question um, sure. that some clients are more uh, receptive to others about um, during this whole COVID situation. And so it can create a lot of stress for who's scheduling the appointments. Um, do you have any ideas on how to set client expectations a little more reasonably or kind of work with them to understand all that's going on? Yeah, so one of the things um, is to understand what makes somebody feel safe. So asking the questions um, of what do they need to make them feel safe. So a company might come in and have their own regulations of this is how we're gonna keep the crew safe, we're not going to go to the door, we're not going to interact with the homeowner. Um, however, asking the homeowner, you know, what is it that they need to feel safe? And then bridging the policies of the company with what the homeowner's needs are. Does that answer the question? Absolutely. Well, seeing that, I think we've answered all the questions. This might be a good place to, uh, to end, um, but I encourage everybody, I think it's probably a great topic. I, I think a lot of people are asking about their staff to share the uh, PowerPoint and the recording, which will be posted on TCIA.org with your staff. You know, they'll have access to it. Um, I think it'll be a good uh, sharing opportunity. So thank you to everybody who has uh, participated today and uh, stay healthy, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Yeah, thank, thank you, Amanda. You. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thank you to TCIA for having me.